but he's got zero tolerance for any hint of bureaucracy. And uh, he often asked us to uh, take special forces methods. Previously, GM built and then crushed the EV1 electric vehicle, while a small California-based company called AC Propulsion built the T0, but was unwilling to commercialize it. While in 2003, a new company by the name of Tesla Motors was formed and ready to see how far they could develop this new technology and maybe even compete with the likes of Detroit and the global auto industry. But in order to do so, Tesla first had to create a test mule. First thing we did was to create Tesla test mule, uh, which was to take a Lotus Elise and, and then highly modify it to add the Tesla battery pack and the AC propulsion drivetrain. The, the reality is that the like, creation of Tesla was based on two fundamentally false premises um, <laughs> that turned out to be, in retrospect, staggeringly dumb. Um, so the one was that, the, uh, that we'd, we'd be able to sort of slightly modify our Lotus Elise, um, add an electric powertrain for, using AC propulsion technology, and and, and then be done, and that would work. And in, in reality, when you convert a car to electric, and you want to make it something that passes all of the federal safety standards and, um, and, and, and all the legalities necessary for, for a road legal car, you actually have, you, you invalidate all of the crash tests, um, and the battery pack ended up being too big to fit in the car, so we had to stretch the chassis. Um, and you, you, we couldn't use the at the air conditioning system because that was previously run off of the motor or the, the, or the engine power. So we need to have a new AC system. We had a new wiring harness. Um, all new suspension, all new brakes. All new suspension, all new brakes because the car was 30% heavier. The body was all different. Uh, in the end, um, only about maybe 6 or 7% of the, the Tesla Roadster had parts in common with any other car period. And then the, the AC propulsion technology, while, while great for a, a prototype, actually ended up uh, not being producible. Like an, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't reliable, it wasn't producible, and it wasn't consistent, and it would break down all the time. To solve these issues, Tesla set out to build a team. And the main team of prototype builders consisted of J.B. Straubel, Gene Berdachevsky, who had connections with J.B. from his days at Stanford, working on solar-powered cars, and David Lyons, a talented mechanical engineer who recalls the special forces type seal that Elon and the Tesla team had at the time. Elon, I think, is uh, pretty much the same kind of person that he has been most of his life. He's one of the most driven individuals I've ever met. He's got incredibly high bandwidth, but he's got zero tolerance for any hint of bureaucracy. And uh, he often asked us to uh, take special forces methods to get our jobs accomplished. And, uh, and I can what imagine. What did that mean? Well, it meant basically um, try is not good enough, you need to do. And uh, basically results matter. Um, and, uh, and to not let things get in the way that most people would be stumbled by or snagged by. So we, uh, we, you know, we, we broke through uh, any red tape with a machete, and uh, we had a, a great deal of incentive to make sure we were accomplishing uh, what we were uh, set out to do and what his vision was. Um, in, in that case, it was electric vehicle powertrain. The power electronics were also a challenge in itself. The motor controller, the brain, the computer that actually controlled the motor was 100% analog. I mean, it was, it was this unbelievable invention. I, I mean, it, act, genius engineering to actually make it run at all, um, but it wasn't something we could reproduce. To help solve this issue, Tesla hired Drew Baglino. JB mentioned Al Alan Cucconi. Um, Alan Cucconi actually we, we tried to figure out what some of his circuits did, and we would simulate them and be like, oh, this is what it does. And then three months later, we'd be like, no, that's what it does. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a learning by doing. On January the 27th, 2005, the Tesla team pulled off one of their first miracles, finishing the test mule, or engineering prototype one, in just three months by a team of 18 people. And then, to help raise more capital, Elon took some potential investors for a test drive. 
Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, I remember like in the early days giving a, a test drive to uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, um, who I've known for a long time, and and there was some like bug in the system, and 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 damn it, and, like the the car would only go 10 miles an hour. <laughs> It's like, look, I swear, guys, it goes way faster than this. <laughs> uh, anyway, they, but they were kind enough to put a little investment into the company nonetheless, despite the world's worst demo. Happy with the progress that Tesla Motors was making so far? Elon Musk added another 9 out of $13 million Series B financing round in February of 2005. About a month later, EP2, or Engineering Prototype 2, was built. And things were looking good until July 4th, 2005. Our team took some of the cells outside, charged them up and forced them into thermal runaway. And they were very exciting. Mm -hmm. So then we made a, a, uh, a small uh, representation of what we thought our, our large battery pack was going to be like. We went up to my house up here in the hills, dug a big hole in the ground, put that down in the ground, put a camera down in there, put a big piece of plywood on top of it and a lot of weight, and then forced that that group of, of cells into thermal runaway to see what happened. And the, it was very exciting. And the result of that was our first really big schedule slip. That was when we yeah. said that until we get a, a handle on this, this lithium ion safety issue, it's a day-for-day it's day schedule slip right. until we figure it out. Yeah, and, and I want to say we never did that again. After, after that, that one really thing, fun. no, at your house, <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we then uh, rented a fire pad, you know, <laughs> A yep. fire pad on the bay, you know, controlled by the fire marshal from that point on. Yep. Well, that was partially we then learned. It's like, oh, we really need to take this in, right. a, in a way that we... Right, really and, and that was the right thing to do. I mean, yeah. and this was, you know, it's one of these things where we, we saw there was a potential problem and we went and learned that lesson pretty right. quickly. That you have to prove on the battery design that, that you, you, you should be able to assume that any of your cells in your battery system will, for reasons you don't understand, go into thermal runaway, and you have to prove that when it does, it does not propagate to adjacent cells. That was the rule yeah. we set, and it took a while before we could do that. Right. We had, we had a crew of, of people working out how to do this battery system. I mean, you know, how, to, how to mount the cells, how to cool them. We invented this cooling tube that went through them, how to make the electrical connection. We originally tried to use uh, uh, resistance welding, which was the, the no normal way of doing electrical connection to cells, to, to lithium ion cells, until we came along, we discovered that that was, was unreliable and, uh, and worse than that, you, you couldn't tell if, if you made a good weld or not at the time of, of assembly. And, and we, we, we experimented with a lot of different ways to do that and finally settled on wire bonding, which has then become the, 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 what everybody copies now when you're making a, 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 a cylindrical cell battery pack. Yeah. So we had to invent a lot of stuff and there was a lot of trial and error trying different kinds of glues to make the cooling system work, inventing different kinds of cooling tubes, different kinds of insulation. Everything had to be invented from scratch. There was no state of the art. Nobody had ever, ever considered taking you know, nearly 7,000 cells and putting them all together into a battery pack. Nobody had ever done that at all. It was, it was insane when we described it to people. Tesla was able to get the battery safety issue resolved through a lot of testing and trial and error. And in May of 2006, Tesla raised another $40 million through a Series C financing round, with Elon Musk again contributing another $12 million. Once the prototypes were completed, it was time for Tesla Motors to come out of stealth mode and showcase the roadsters of the world on July 19th, 2006 in Santa Monica, California. This picture in 2006 was um, actually from our Roadster launch event. So this was a really pivotal event in the company's history. It was the time when we went out of stealth mode. You know, before this, nobody had ever heard of Tesla. We'd never had a single media article. Um, we'd never taken any uh, customer deposits. We, we had no customers. We had no sales team, actually. No, nothing. Nobody had heard of the company. They thought Tesla Zero. was like it was a rock band. But, but this event was, was awesome. I mean, this was, um, we, we had two prototypes built at this time. So we, we had that yellow yeah. mule that we started out with, and then we built two working prototypes for this event. And uh, you know, we had this kind of concept at the time to do an event where we'd give customers test drives, and then we'd start taking reservations, and, and, all, and do it all at some giant big party, maybe at an airport. And this, this sort of formula became something we, we started to repeat, and it kind of yeah. became the Tesla DNA a little bit of how we would do product launches and, and, uh, and start getting customers closer to the product. This, it, this was at the Santa Monica Airport, and yeah, it, basically in LA. So. And it was just, it was awesome, because we got, you know, we went from zero to having all these customers, hundreds of them, we thought, it was massive numbers, hundreds of them, you know. Yeah, and, and we really thought that was crazy, that like 100 people would buy our car. 
I, we thought maybe we'll, maybe nobody will buy the car, you know, except for like friends and family or something. But, 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 but we got like a, like st total strangers bought the car, which was like, wow, that's really, <laughs> wow, okay. So anyway, it was, it was pretty amazing, even though the cars were basically just, just hardly holding together. Yeah. I mean, those two cars were, <laughs> were basically destroyed by the end of the night. Um, you know, that was our, most of our durability testing, and you know, we even we had to drive them behind a curtain and actually pump ice water through parts of the, the powertrain <laughs> in order to keep it from overheating so we could keep going with more test drives. Um, so nobody knew this at the time. And it, it, was, it was amazing, though. I mean, we left that event yeah. with demand being 10 times what we expected and you know a whole ton of engineering challenges to go solve but we knew for sure that people wanted this car in numbers that nobody else expected they did. The event was a hit and even the governor at the time made an appearance. Before the event starts so we're still setting up we still you know we're, we're no visitors are coming yep. in for another you know two hours I mean it's really early and there had been a rumor that Governor Schwarzenegger who's yep. governor at the time might might show up but you know like who knows, right? So, so we're there, and I'm with one of the other engineers, and we're, you know, the, literally moving chairs around and getting stuff. And in walks Schwarzenegger and his sort of entourage. Just where are the cars? And yep. he comes, yeah. And that I, we, yep. we, neither of us, we were both. We were, it was such a surprise, and it was hours before it was, we were ready. And we just kind of pointed. We didn't say anything. We, and, he's, and he walks over, you know, and gets in one. It was great. As Tesla comes out of stealth mode. On August the 2nd of 2006, Elon published his secret master plan. This is the first blog that I, that I ever wrote for the company, but we needed to figure out how could we, as a, as a tiny company with very few resources, actually make a difference. And the, the only way to do this was to start small, to start with a low volume car, which is why we started with the Tesla Roadster. So with any new technology, it takes multiple iterations and it takes economies of scale before you can make it great and affordable. So step one was the Roadster. The Roadster was high price and low volume. Where it really made a difference was that it showed the world that you could make a compelling electric car. You could make a great electric car. What was unique about the Roadster was it was the first really great electric car. And before the Roadster, people thought an electric car would be would be slow and ugly and low range and have bad performance. And we had to break that mold. It was incredibly important to show that that wasn't true. And so we, we made the Roadster, which is fast, it's beautiful, it's great performance. And then use that money to build a more affordable car, like a mass market sedan, and then use the money from the mass market sedan to build a more affordable car while doing the above also provide zero emission electric power generation options. Well, this vision was clear, powerful, and now with Tesla coming out of stealth mode and receiving plenty of orders, Elon would famously state in the years ahead, prototypes are easy and production is hard, and Tesla Motors will learn the hard way just how difficult it is to not just produce vehicles, but stay alive as a litany of issues soon threaten Tesla and their very survival. And with that, the story continues in the next episode. If you enjoyed the episode and want to help the channel, Patreon is the best way to do so. And also, a big thank you to all Patreon members and Ice Lake Investments for making this documentary series possible. So till next time, I'll catch you guys soon.